This morning, our scripture comes to us from the Gospel of Mark and highlights the final Sunday of the season of Epiphany on the Christian calendar. This week, we're going to be celebrating Ash Wednesday on the 17th as we enter into the season of Lent in preparation for Easter celebration. Epiphany began on January 6th this year, and the weekly gospel readings have all revealed to us something about Jesus, beginning with his baptism by John and his willingness to follow God's commandments, his recognition by Nathaniel as a prophet, followed by numerous uh, readings about healings, casting out of demons, and even a story of the willingness of Jesus to share a table with sinners, showing how much he loved and was concerned for common individuals. And so today our scripture is what we might call the biggest reveal of all, the transfiguration that we just listened to the hymn about Jesus, which helps us to understand his divine nature. And so I'm going to read uh, to you from the second chapter of Mark. I'm sorry, the ninth chapter of Mark, verses two through nine. This is from the Revised Standard Bible. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. And then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it would be good for us to be here, and let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This story of the transfiguration of Jesus is both amazing and confusing at the same time because it seems so surreal. And as my habit, when I prepare uh, to give a Sunday message like this, I look in various commentaries and see what the scholars have to say. And uh, one of them said, you know, if this is the scripture that you have been tasked with preaching on on a given Sunday, you might look at what the other scriptures are and choose one of those. But I decided to be brave and go forward with it and see what I could learn and share with you about this transfiguring moment. And so the disciples have walked with Jesus up a high mountain apart from the crowds. And you probably already know that in the Bible, when it talks about being on a mountain, that always precedes something special is about to happen to the people who are involved. In biblical lore, a mountain is thought to contain divine inspiration and is the focus of pilgrimages which lead to transcendent moments and spiritual elevations. And we've all had those kinds of experiences before sometimes even in the mountains, I know I have. It's a universal symbol of the nearness of God as it surpasses ordinary humanity. Special things happened on mountains for Israel. Israel received the law and made their covenant with God on a mountain. Jesus taught from a mountain as we have been learning about in our adult church school class. And he ascended to heaven from a mountain after commissioning his disciples. It's interesting to me that most of the mountains in Palestine are only a few thousand feet tall. 7,000 feet is a very tall mountain in Palestine. Imagine if the people of that day had seen the Rockies, where Karen and uh, Ron are right now, or the Alps, or the Himalayas. They might have been convinced that they had found the very house of God. And so Jesus leads his friends up the mountain. Is this unusual story some kind of a quest? And then they get there, and the disciples have a visionary experience, 
of Jesus being changed right before their very eyes into a glowing figure of whiteness and bright light as he was transfigured before them. The Greek word that is used here for transfigured is metamorphothē, from which we get the word metamorphosis. We use this word to describe the process by which a caterpillar becomes a butterfly, a, a truly dramatic transformation in, in my humble opinion. I remember last Sunday or last summer when Julie Canterbury uh, had a monarch butterfly, uh, a caterpillar uh, form the cocoon and she posted pictures on Facebook of the progress of the caterpillar as it uh, went through metamorphosis and became a beautiful butterfly. But when we talk about the metamorphosis of a person, we're often speaking of a profound change in the nature of that person into something that's completely new, worked by the will of the divine. And we have in this story an appearance from the two greatest prophets of the Hebrew ages, Moses, who led the Israelites out of captivity in Egypt, and Elijah, who saved the very heritage of Israel from the prophets of Baal in the ninth century BC, ensuring that the belief of the Hebrew people in the one true God would be able to continue. And in the midst of all of this activity and these visionary uh, appearances by famous prophets, Peter's almost fumbling, trying to figure out something to do or something to say in all of this. And Mark points out that Peter and the other disciples were afraid. And all he can come up with is he wants to build three dwellings or tents for Moses and Elijah and Jesus. Is Peter planning a camp out? What's going on here? Who's, who's going to bring the charcoal to this camp out? So there must be some symbolism in our story. Why are Moses and Elijah here? Well, Moses, as we know, was the giver of the law to Israel, the sacred Torah. And Elijah's name means Yahweh is my God. And he's the one whom Israel believed would appear on the mountains of Palestine to announce the coming of the Messiah. And because of his miracle, some people thought that Elijah might have even been God himself. And so when Jesus, in his teachings to his disciples, talks about the law and the prophets, as he often mentioned, it was these two holy people to whom he was referring. Because in the minds of the children of Israel, Moses and Elijah are the law and the prophets. Is Jesus now equal with these two and the great things that they did? Is that the message of the transfiguration? It's been suggested by some that this event is not something that happened in the middle of the Jesus story as it's recorded in Mark, but it's something that may have happened after he was crucified and resurrected, some kind of resurrection recollection or story about Jesus that someone remembered. And Mark either intentionally or unknowingly got the stories out of order and put it in the middle of his gospel rather than at the end. Others disagree with that and say that the transfiguration should rightly be placed in the middle of Mark's account about Jesus' life and not at the end. Up until this point, the things that Mark has been telling us about Jesus have primarily been about what he was doing and what he was saying, healing, teaching, and preaching. And most of what happens after the transfiguration in Mark's timeline is about Jesus preparing himself and his disciples for his crucifixion and his resurrection. And so if that's the case, placing the transfiguration here makes sense. To have the disciples not just see what it is that Jesus does or listen to what he says, but to truly begin to understand who he is, the Messiah, and the melding together of humanity and the divine. And what is up with Peter? Mark tells us Peter wants to put up dwellings for Jesus and the two visitors. Seeing Moses and Elijah, Peter was thinking that this moment 
must be a signal to celebrate one of the three great feast days of Judaism, a seven day holiday called Sukkot, when faithful Jews were to try to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And part of the celebrating of that holiday included the setting up of tents or tabernacles as they were called, which were reminiscent of the humble dwelling places of the Israelites when they traveled through the wilderness following Moses. And on the slide that Robert has up there for you, you see uh, a modern day dwelling or a tent that has been set up to remember the holiday of Sukkot. And in addition to the canvas and the wood walls as uh, somebody might construct if they were living in the outdoors in the wilderness, you notice that plants have been hung uh, on the tent uh, in addition to the cloth and the wood. And that's because God's commandment to the people of how they were to build their tents included the use of organic uh, plant materials as part of, of the structure. And they continue to do that today in their celebrations. But Sukkot was believed to be the time when these two great prophets would reappear to proclaim the one that God had chosen one to be the Messiah, in this case, Jesus. The prophet Zechariah had even written that God would use this festival of the tabernacles, as it was called, to announce that the day of the Lord had arrived. And Peter was responding in the belief that the moment had come. Put up the tents. Begin the feast of Sukkot. God, through his greatest prophets, Moses and Elijah, is proclaiming the Messiah. And so Peter's not confused at all. He knew the Torah. He understood that Jesus could be the Messiah. And we remember that this story takes place only six days after Peter's confession about who Jesus was. When Jesus, as he was traveling to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, north of the Sea of Galilee, asked Peter, who do the people say that I am? And Peter said to Jesus, some say you're John the Baptist, others say Elijah or one of the prophets. And when Jesus looked at Peter and he said, who do you say that I am? Peter said, you are the Messiah. And now Peter is in this transfiguring moment and sees that his insight has been confirmed. So clearly this moment is an epiphany, a further pronouncement about who Jesus was and his place as the Son of God. Jesus of Nazareth truly was someone special, God's promised Messiah. Was it Mark's purpose to show that Jesus was the next great prophet of Israel, walking in the very footsteps of Moses and Elijah? After all, both of them, according to the Hebrew scriptures, were taken directly up into heaven by God at the ends of their earthly lives, just as Jesus shortly would be after his resurrection. At the transfiguration, then, Jesus stands in impressive company, sharing the moment with two others who knew what it was to be in close communion with God. And Peter and James and John are the only witnesses to this moment, and up till this time, James and John have been silent. We have no clue what they were thinking. It seems that Peter, though, understands the significance of the transfiguration. He gets it. Jesus is more than just teacher and healer. Jesus is God's messenger, the Messiah. So I thought about Peter in this event. I began to play through uh, some of the things that were yet to come that we'll be talking about as we get closer to Easter and how Peter would deny Jesus three times on the eve before the crucifixion. How does a person witness this transfiguration experience, having such a spiritual validation that Jesus was the, the Messiah, and then come to deny the very moment? I would think that being part of this mountaintop moment would have compelled every cell in Peter's Jewish brain to know beyond a shadow of a doubt who Jesus was. But when it mattered most, Peter still denied what he had seen and what he had heard. Stubborn man, but aren't we all at times? Well, where does this bring us? 2,000 years have passed since this experience of Jesus' three disciples on the mountain, revealing to them who he was and who he would be. 
How is Jesus being revealed to us today? Who is Jesus to me and to you? And how has the story of Jesus transformed our lives? I'm going to admit something this morning. When I was in my childhood, I thought it would be great to have a vision of Jesus. My young brain was filled with all of the stories of 14-year-old Joseph Smith and the visions that he had and that others in the early church had in the Latter-day Saint movement. And I really wanted something like that for myself. And I would say, Jesus, just show yourself to me. And I'll believe it's all true. I have lots of questions about the stuff that I've learned in church and in Sunday school, but I knew if I could just see Jesus standing there in the bright lights, I could convince myself that everything was true. But for me, that vision never came. But the story helps me as I think about Peter. I'm not sure it would have mattered if I had seen a vision like that. It was not the vision of Jesus that convinced Peter because he was still afraid, he still doubted, and in the end, he failed the test. Peter saw Jesus transfigured on the mountain, but it would be some time before Peter was transformed himself when the Holy Spirit rested on the disciples on the day of Pentecost, and they finally found their strength to speak. And so for me, I'm content to allow transformation to come slowly and methodically, to work with me as I am able to work with God. It's more of a process than a single moment in time. And the more I learn and understand the meaning of what Jesus said, the more I feel like a disciple. I love the adult class that we share together and how we talk with one another dissecting and reconstructing the parables and the Sermon on the Mount, all of those things are helping me to understand what Jesus really was about. His practical message of empathy and compassion for others speaks to my heart and speaks to my mind in ways that I can understand. His interpretation of how the law was intended to be a guide for living and not a burden has answered many questions. Jesus' proclamation that the kingdom of God is for now and not for some distant far off time after I'm removed from this earth gives me hope that we can still live as a people transformed by his message and story. I believe that we can experience a personal metamorphosis that enables us to be the creations that Jesus has called us to be. President Steve Vesey in the past two years has spoken about metamorphosis as the kind of change to which the church is being called. And he noted in one of uh, his texts that metamorphosis is more than just the incremental change and adjustment that we need to make. That kind of process, especially when we are in the experience of change, will be anxiety producing and painful, and ultimately liberating in terms of the nature of the church and its mission in the world as we move forward to become the authentic community of Christ. This morning, I feel incredibly blessed by this challenge to be a transformed person. I am blessed to have had and to now have people in my life who live the words and actions of Jesus and make it real for me. Some of them aren't even members of the community of Christ. I'm blessed to have all of you in my life sharing this journey. And may you all be blessed as you discover for yourselves who Jesus is.